Good morning again. Good to see everyone today at 11 o'clock, uh, first Sunday of the new year. Today is the Lord's Day. It's a good day to gather. The Christ community every Sunday is Easter Sunday because we celebrate the resurrected one, the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. So a uh, happy Sunday to all of you. So thankful uh, that you have decided to gather with us today. And all the visitors in the room, thank you so much for coming today. Look forward to meeting you after the service. And a big hello to all those who are joining us online. I know many people choose to check us out online before they ever step into this room in person. So thanks for doing that. And hello to all of our regular Christ community at home, uh, friends and family and members. So thank you so much for joining us there. Let me say a quick word regarding <clears throat> something that I've heard called COVID, if you've not heard of that yet. Uh, with cases rising in our community, I just want to uh, encourage you to stay home if you uh, are symptomatic or have come into close contact with someone who is symptomatic. Uh, we're all trying to get through the winter together, and so uh, we're you know the new variant thankfully is less um, uh, less of, has less of an impact on people, but still let's be wise. Let's try to, um, you know, guard and love one another and get through this together. Uh, we're going to continue to provide options. We have this service, our 915 service. We have our mass required service at 915, the sanctuary, if you'd rather do that. And we also have this wonderful Christ community at home. So encourage you if, you know, showing signs, let's just be cautious. The whole when in doubt, leave it out idea. So let's, when in doubt, let's leave it out. All right. So let's do that together. Thanks for all your support. Uh, as we seek to keep the church gathered and on mission together, you guys have been so kind to our staff team who's done a great job, and we're thankful for all those things. All right, open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are beginning a new series today called Simple Gospel. Simple Gospel. And uh, I really, it's our desire, it's my desire to help you understand more deeply the gospel to be more able to articulate the gospel more clearly to others. And so to help uh, in that endeavor, we're going to spend the next four weeks uh, talking about the gospel. And in your seat, you received a copy of the book, What is the Gospel? Now, if you look back over 2021, you're like, you know what I didn't do? I didn't read or complete one book at all. Here's your opportunity. We're giving you this book. This is an easy read. You can sit down and read it with about two hours. And, and I want to encourage you this month to grab this book, take it home with you, and read it. Apply it to your life. All of our community groups are going to be going through this book. We bought a thousand of them, so we've made a pretty big investment in this book and giving it to you to have and to read and to discuss, because we believe this book is going to help you as you think about more deeply the gospel and how to articulate it to others. Inside of there as well, you're going to find this wonderful Christ Community bookmark. Uh, today begins 21 days of prayer for us as a church as we're trying to pray specifically as a faith family for five things. For personal spiritual growth in each one of our lives, for our marriage and our families, for our church as a whole, our ministry budget and fruit of all we're doing this year for Christ Community Denver that launches on January 23rd as well as Easter 2022 as we have Easter services not just in one location but in two locations at multiple service times and so we're going to go over the next 21 days focused on prayer so when you pull out your Bible time in the mornings grab this pray through it and this will also serve as a guide for the rest of your year if you so choose to do so. That is for you to take with you. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is writing. He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Verses 1 through 5. Here we go. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance that uh, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. 
We open it aloud today. We read it before your people. We ask that you would bless it. Bless this sermon. I'm going to hide behind your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd be exalted in our hearts, in the hearts of every person in this room today. As we study that which Paul says is of first importance, the gospel, that Christ died for our sin, that he was buried, and that he arose. Lord, I pray that you would show us who you are today so that we might understand who we are in light of that and what that means for our life. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I know uh, a little about a lot of things, but there's few things I know a lot about. Honestly, there's not much worth knowing a whole lot about in this world. A lot of people live to know a lot about a lot of things, and they spend a lot of time and resources and money and knowing a lot. You know, uh, over the weekend, the famed Betty White passed away at 99 years old. Just two weeks shy of her 100-year birthday. Uh, she was planning a big, uh, a big birthday celebration. I saw online that they, 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 were, they were doing this whole big Betty White special for her birthday on the 16th of January. And she was going to make a big deal out of it. It's going to be really special. And then before you know it, she was just like that. She has gone. She's passed away. Now, at 99 years old, you could bet that Betty White knew a lot of things about a lot of things. Betty White is Betty White. She's lived 99 years old. She's got to know a lot. But on the moment that she breathed her last breath, there's only one thing that mattered. Only one thing mattered at that moment. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Had she heard the gospel? Had she believed upon the gospel? Had she Comb the depths of the gospel and found joy in it. Based on her public life and her career, I'm not sure that she did. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says he desires to remind the church and remind us today of the gospel I preach to you, he says, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. So Paul knew the implications of understanding the gospel, that it wasn't just the doorway into a salvation that we get. It's not just something we believed back then, but he says the gospel which you received, the gospel you are presently standing in and your hope is in, Jesus alone right now presently resting in Jesus, but it's the gospel that is also sanctifying us, forming us daily the one that we are being eternally saved by, being glorified and sanctified by. This gospel is a present work in our life. He says the gospel is of first importance, that Christ died for our sins. He gives it to us again, the gospel, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, makes that very clear. He was dead and he was buried And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul had been all around the world, right? He had experienced a lot. He had seen a lot of things. He knew his life before Jesus. He knew how he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And he knew how Jesus had totally transformed his life. And he writes from this place of experience. And there's one thing he says that matters above them all. There's one thing that's of first importance. The gospel, he says. There's only one thing worth knowing a lot about, the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's four subjects that really go hand in hand with knowing and understanding the gospel that we must communicate to people, and we ourselves must communicate, and this book frames those four things out for us. This is why this book is so helpful. Those four subjects are this, God, man, Christ, response. Now, I want you to say those words with me. Everyone say God. Everyone say man. Everyone say Christ. Everyone say response. All right, let's do it again. Everyone say God. Man. Christ. Response. Those four subjects are what we're going to look at over the next four year, uh, the four, the next four weeks, and we start with God. 
A right understanding of the gospel must always begin with God. See, God is creator, and we are accountable to him. God is creator, and we are accountable to him. Paul writes earlier in Romans chapter 1, he says this in verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, so ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. See, the Bible says that God has made himself known in two ways, in creation and in our conscience. We look around us, we see the sun blazing in the sky, and we see the, the seasons, the death of winter, the life of springtime births, the beautiful life of summer, then the death of fall into the dead of winter again. We can see God's creation as we lie outside at night looking up into the stars, and God has made himself known in all of creation. God has made himself known in your life. If you consider our own bodies, the human body is so fascinating with our eyes and our ears and our voices and our taste buds and all that we can do, that we can speak, that we can learn in the capacity of our minds. We are intellectual beings. God has created us and he's given us inside of us a conscience to know right and wrong. We feel things like shame and we feel guilt and we feel hurt and we feel harm. We feel conviction. God has put his self in us. He, he has made it so we desire to know him, to know who he is. This is why you can show up in a, in a random tribe or village somewhere where there's been no human interaction with others. And they have in and of themselves created for themselves a being, a God, because God cries out from the hearts of us longing for him. The way we know him is through the gospel. Genesis 1-1 reminds us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I'm not going to dive into that. On January 30th, we are going to begin a series through the book of Genesis, so we'll have plenty of time to talk about Genesis then. But notice it says in the beginning that God created. Everything after that verse flows from that truth, that God created it all, therefore it all belongs to him. He's the author of it. If we believe that, we must believe the rest of God's word. There is a beginning of all of this, and there is one who created, the God, the creator. So we must come to this reality that God is creator. And he is the one who created all that we have and all that we see and all that we know. And he created you and he created me. God has given a, us a means by which we can know him, to know his character, to know his attributes, to know his plans. Who he is determines who we are. It determines what we believe about self, about sin, about salvation, about eternity. Four major characteristics of God is his supremacy, his holiness, his righteousness, and his love. And I want to look at all four of those real quickly over the next 20 minutes. We're going to explain every one of them clearly and easily. I'm just kidding. Let's first consider God's supremacy briefly. See, our modern culture with all of its money and all of its affluence and its intelligence would have you believe that we have reached the pinnacle of knowledge, that we know so much with our advances in science, our, our elite medical professionals, our celebrity idols and know-it-all politicians would have us believe that they are our little saviors, that, that we just need to, to trust in them to protect us, to trust in them to prosper us. But despite what culture may think. Man is not supreme above all. 
There is only one who reigns supreme above all. That is the God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one of which we've gathered to sing about today. Did you think about that today? You came in and grabbed your coffee and your slow moving rainy morning and you gathered on this first Sunday of the year. Did you think I've come to gather with the people of God? To praise this God who is holy, who is supreme, who is just to celebrate the resurrection of his son, Jesus? To come with a heart prepared to meet with him today, to hear from his word, and to praise him for his glory and his work in your life, to sustain you through another year, to give you life and breath. Or well, Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited for you and for me. I am the Lord, He says, and there is no other. There is no other but God who forms man in His image and fashions us into His Likeness, as Genesis 1, 26 through 27 says. Amen. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God made us in his likeness, in his supreme nature. He created us to reflect his image and his character to the world. We are like him when we show love. We are like him when we can create things out of nothing, like, like airplanes. Like I still... Like, I don't know, I, I can't, maybe I'm dumb, I don't know about airplanes. That's like a lot of metal in the sky. And then they're like, let's throw 300 people on there and transport them 14 hours across the world. When we subdue the earth's natural resources and we create these things, all these things bring glory to our creator because we are made in his image. God is caused us to be made in his image and we can do things that bring him praise and glory because he is supreme above all. It is him through which we've been created and by which we are to glorify and live and have our breath and meaning. He is supreme. Number two, God is holy. That word holy comes from the Hebrew word kadesh, meaning separated, meaning marked off or placed apart. He is set apart from everything. God is transcendent above his creation. He is distinct from everything else. He's distinct from humans. He's distinct from angels. He is distinct from everything. There's no one like him, and certainly no one is holy like him. Both Testaments of Scriptures testify, describe God as holy, holy, holy. This description is the highest attribute by which God may be called. It's the highest attribute den uh, denoted in Scripture. It's said that God's holiness is the attribute by which all others flow. Nothing exceeds His holiness, and all things fr flow from His holiness. God is loving because He is holy. God is righteous because he is holy. God is patient because he is holy. God is just because he is holy. If not for God's holiness, he would be unloving and unrighteous and unjust and impatient. Everything flows from his holiness. Therefore, above all else, we must know that God is holy and what we believe about God's holiness determines what we believe about our sin, about ourself, and about our need for salvation, and about eternity and where we will spend it. Because it's of God's holiness, we see our sin as rebellion. And any breach of sin at all is a breach of God's holy character. It's rebellion against His creation, against His character. Sin is not the nature of God as as we were reminded last week, holiness is his nature. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There is no stain on God, no stain of sin. There's no brokenness. He is perfect in every 
way. And God's holiness is really important to understanding the gospel. Think about the progressive nature by which we must understand God's holiness in order to be saved. Before a person can be saved, they must know that they are lost and in need of saving. And before a person can know that they are lost, they must know that they are sinners. And before they can grasp the nature of sin, they must know that there's a standard to be met. And that standard is God's holiness, his perfection. He is holy, and in him there is no darkness. Therefore, those who are not holy cannot stand in his presence. Amen. Yet here we sit in his presence, worshiping him today because of the one holy man, Jesus Christ. God is holy, and in him is complete holiness. Number three, God is righteous. When we talk about God's righteousness, we're talking about the moral excellence of God. He is always correct and never wrong. Everything he does is good and right. He is righteous. As Psalm 119, 142 says, your righteousness is righteous forever. Like his righteousness is righteous for us, like a double thing. Like your righteousness is forever righteous. What a, what a great like worship. God, your righteousness is forever worship. He says in Psalm 7, 9, Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, oh, righteous God. Everything God does is good and right. De Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he, thus he always acts. God always acts in a way that is consistent with who he is. Amen. Always. All that he does is consistent with his righteous character. Him being perfectly righteous means that he loves righteousness and he hates that which is contrary to righteous. He hates wickedness and evil and the like. So as it's been noted by many, God, the righteous one, cannot be morally neutral or apathetic towards anyone that is anything less than perfectly righteous. This calls into question, what does that mean for sinful people like you and I? The Bible calls God the judge. He is judge of all. Psalm 9, 7 through 8. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. So he judges the world, humanity, by his standard of perfect holiness and fully righteousness. This is the way that it is. We all want this kind of judge in our earthly courts, don't we? We want a, a righteous and good judge. When one's done evil, grave evil, murder, race, uh, a, a, a rapist, we want justice delivered. We want a judge who punishes evil. But in our society, many people want a God who punishes certain evils, just not our evil. We want a God who deals with those sins but we want a loving God who doesn't see our rebellion. Our culture wants a God that deals with others but pats us on the back and gives us what we want despite us not living for him or his glory. They want one who deals with sin but not their own. That's not how God works. In God's court, righteous is righteous and sin is sin. See, it's good news that God is both righteous and just if he were not, then we'd have no hope for eternity with him. It's because of God's righteousness that we can know that we are not righteous and thus in need of saving. This is why when we present the gospel, we need to be exposing the unrighteousness of men. This is one of the most loving things we can do. One of the most awful things we could do to anyone is to be in a friendship to be in a relationship with someone who is not a believer and never 
tell them that they will one day stand before God to have accountability for their sin. But one of the most loving things we can do is to tell them who God is and what God expects so that it might uncover their own sinfulness and they say, what can I do? Because seeing our sinfulness is key to seeing our need. See, the truth of God's righteousness puts a spotlight on our lives. Are we righteous? No, not one of us is like God, perfectly holy and fully righteous. A righteous God would accept no less than one who has lived a life of moral perfection so that we say there's no way we can do that. We are sinners. It doesn't matter how many times you've prayed to whoever or how many times you've confessed your sin to whoever or how many times you've given or gone or done or whatever. There's no amount of good works that you or I could do to get ourselves to the standard of righteousness God desires. Only one can, and the man that is Jesus Christ. Which leads me talking about God's love. God is love. He is loving. It is his nature. There's really three things I talk about when I talk about God's love and where you could see the love of God. You can see the love of God in his creation, his character, and his cross. His creation, his character, and his cross. When you talk about creation, the creation of man and woman is the pinnacle of God's creation. He looks upon his creation and says, it is very good. He is pleased in creating man to glorify himself. He's pleased in giving mankind dominion over the world. He's pleased in doing these things. Even David, when he talks about how God has formed David, in Psalm 139, David just exalts in God's good creation and his kindness in creating him. Listen to Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Praise the Lord for his love in creating. God places us in places to honor him and to glorify him. We could look around and know the love of God for his for his world, for his people. We talk about the love of God seen in his character. Love is not something God does, but it is who he is. It is, it is a key part of his nature. It defines God. He is loving. He's loving to pursue us. He's loving to save us. He's loving to use us. There are tons of verses I could have thrown out here. I was holding back on the verses. Let me just give you a couple. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love God, uh, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. 1 Chronicles 16, 34, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 63, 3, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. I praise you because of your love for me. God's character is fully loving. The third place we see it is on the cross. When we're born into this world, we do not bring him glory. We bring us glory. Our lives are largely lived from birth until we meet Christ by those three famous people, me, myself, and I. I want it my way. I want it now. I want this. I want that. Why aren't you here now? What about this? When are you going to come through for me here? What's going on, God? Why, I, I was told this. Why, why aren't you showing up on my dime, on my dime, on my dime? Where are you at? We love ourselves. Even in this culture right now we live in is very defined by me, myself, and I. And what I want, even, even modern Christian music right now is I, I, I-centric and not God-centric not centered on who God is, not giving us truths of the scriptures to sing, to remind ourselves of the promises of God. Genesis 3 lands us in a state of separation with the creator, ushering in punishment, sin, and death. When you see our forefathers and foremother just disobey and rebel against God, it ushers in sin, leading us to rebel and 
running from God, born into this place, ultimately leading to God's greatest demonstration of love, sending his son Jesus to live among his people, to die on the cross, to bear the weight of the wrath of God's anger on sin, to be buried, to raise to life. The ultimate demonstration of God's love is seen at the cross on Calvary. Well, Romans 5, 8 says, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love is seen as in creation and in his character and in his cross to bring the lost home. It goes to reason then. It goes to reason that if God is creator, then his creation, his creatures are accountable to him. We, his creatures, every man and every woman who's ever been born is accountable to our creator, God. And when we take up the gospel, we must first acknowledge that God is creator and thus all things lay under his supremacy. They lay under his power. And in his infinite wisdom and eternal plan, he brought to life all there is, even us all in this room. And he sustains our life, even our own breath, Job 12 says, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. The breath that you are taking right now is sustained by our supreme, holy, righteous, loving God to whom we will one day give an account. You see, a right view of God leads to a right understanding of self, of sin, of salvation, of eternity. And a low view of God leads to not really caring about sin. We end up caring a lot about ourselves. We have a low view of God. We end up caring a lot about what we want, what our priorities are, what we're expecting, what we're chasing after, what brings us pleasure, We don't really care that much about sin. We excuse the things we do. Who cares about this? We'll skip here. Well, we're not worried about this. Oh, that guy's evil, but don't come looking at me. But see, when you have a right view of God, you begin to go, man, these things matter a lot more than I expected. Because a low view of God produces a low view of sin, and a high view of God produces a high view of sin. And we're reminded of the accountability we will all one day have. Matthew 12, Jesus says, I tell you on that day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Oh, listen, Genesis 1 reminds us that in the beginning, God created. And if there is a beginning, then there is coming and into it as well. And it is there where all of us stand before supreme, holy, righteous God to give an account for our lives. Every word spoken, every thought, thought, and every deed done. Everything. And on that day, only one thing will matter. Only one thing. As Betty White would tell you right now, only the gospel matters. And it's that truth which is to lead us to believe upon Jesus Christ for salvation. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes into a right relationship with God but by Jesus. He is the reason many of us here today can sing before God because of the blood of Jesus, because of the righteousness of Jesus that's covered our sin. It's the reason we have hope. It's the reason we have rest. It's not in our own striving and our own chasing after good works, but only in his righteousness that we are counted worthy to come in the presence of God. And it's in that truth that we are to examine the fruit of our own lives, the fruit fruit of our lives, and ask, are we in the Spirit? Like, am I, is my life living testimony of God's work in and through me? Is there fruit of salvation in my life? 
Are you walking the Holy Spirit, living out the things of God, producing fruit consistent with repentance, living out the commands of Scripture daily, seeking to lead others to faith in Jesus, caring for our loved ones and our family members and our neighbors, co-workers to know Jesus? And it's that truth which is to lead us to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. Is your life wholly surrendered to God? Not just, I prayed a prayer to get out of hell free, but is my life viewing Christ as my present salvation? It's not just that I professed Jesus, but I possess Jesus today. He's forming me. He's walking with me. He's molding me. And he's not just my Savior. He's my Lord. All of my life, my home, my cars, my money, my mouth, My body, all of it belongs to him. Whatever he wants, wherever he wants me to go, I belong to him because he saved me from sin and he saved me from death and he saved me from hell and I am his. Oh Lord, whatever you want. Holy surrendered all my heart, all my soul, my strength, all my mind belongs to you. Are you fighting sin in your life? Are you just letting sin go? Do you have brothers and sisters in your life who are helping you fight sin? Like confessing to the church, hey, I'm struggling with this. Struggling. Hey, I need to walk in holiness. This is, this is not good. Are you walking in community with your church? If you don't know him today, you can by believing this gospel that Paul shares of first importance. That Jesus died for your sins. That he was buried and that he was raised to life in accordance for the promises of God. And if you would put all of your hope in Jesus, you will be saved. That means repenting of your way of life and surrendering to him today.